God is good. And all the time. Amen. It's such a joy to be able to share that together and declare uh, praise that God loves us as a father and he's taking care of us. Um, for those of you that are visiting with us this morning, welcome. It's a blessing to have you here with us. We pray that you're blessed as uh, we get to worship our God. Ray, thank you so much for kicking off the service by, thinking, by talking about God being our Father and that joy that we have to be able to celebrate that He loves us. He's fathering us. Um, we're adopted children of His. He, he loves us that much that He was willing to adopt us and pay that price, and we get to celebrate that joy. For those of you that are live streaming along with us this morning, welcome. Um, I'll just be honest. We had so few kids up here this morning. Hopefully they're live streaming with us right now because so many of them are out camping right now and celebrating Father's Day in that, in that fashion. So it is a blessing to be able to have you all here with us and especially for those that are live streaming. We're thankful that it is able to work out for such a time as this and everything. Gentlemen, dads that are in here and uh, guys that have been working as spiritual mentors in the life of others, happy Father's Day such a joy to be able to say that and to be able to celebrate that because being a father, being a good father, is about being more like God, being made in his image. Same thing that we got to say for Mother's Day and celebrate that truth, that we're made in his image, male and female. And there's aspects of God and qualities of God that we get to experience and enjoy um, as we live, as our families change, as we mentor others. And so happy Father's Day to all the gentlemen that are in here. Last night, I had an experience that um, was a bit embarrassing. <laughs> now, I had other illustrations that I was going to share, and I was really ashamed of being able to, of sharing one or two of those with you this morning. And then this one came up, and I'm like, sweet, I'm going to use this one, because it's a whole lot less embarrassing than those other ones. I was sitting ar around a campground, and we didn't have a fire, because we weren't allowed to have one where we were at, which is really frustrating. But still, we were sitting around, and we were talking. We had just finished a meal. The kids had been running around and riding bikes around the campground area, and it, we just had a really fantastic day. It was a great joy. I had this really big oversized folding chair that's like cushioned and wonderful and it's just great. I'm so thankful Karina found them there at Sam's Club and if you go there, let them know that. Maybe I'll get like some sort of sponsorship from them. But still being said, I'm sitting in this huge oversized chair and my other chair that Karina got's turned kind of 90 degrees to me and Caden was sitting there. I was in a deep intellectual spiritual conversation as a good minister would be around a camp fire that's not existing, and talking with one of our brothers in Christ about leadership, and it was, we were having a really good um, discussion, and I, I think it was at, the, oh, he's not in here right now, I think it was at this point he was talking about books that I need to read, and I was like, yes, yes, I'm totally in this. It, it was um, dusk, it was getting darker, and Caden was over there on the phone, Karina was doing some other things, um, people were milling about, there was conversations going on, I was paying attention to everything, trying to be a really good father, and seeing where my kids were, making sure that they're safe, and then all of a sudden I looked over at the seat where Caden was supposed to be and I couldn't see him. And I'm like, oh my goodness, where's Caden? I was like, Caden, where are you? He leans forward and goes, I'm right here. <laughs> I had lost him. Now, if I, I remember back now looking at that. I, I should have seen his two little feet sticking out there. But man, was I ashamed because everybody looks at me <laughs> and like in ridicule and they're like, start making fun of me. And like, wow, Ty, you're blind and start, just start making fun of me. And shame just swept over me. Like, I felt this embarrassment. I wanted to run away. I also wanted to fight and, like, totally defend myself and be like, it's getting dark out here, and there's light in the background, and the contrast, and the brightness, and you guys are mean. <laughs> but instead, I just said, oh, great, he's there. About five minutes later, <laughs> I'm in a deep conversation still with my brother. We're talking about leadership, and we're talking about being good dads, and I look over, and I don't see Caden anymore, and I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> and so I'm kind of looking in the depths of the chair that he's in, and it's like thinking that it swallowed him, I'm like, all right, where's Caden, and so my shame immediately made me think for a second, and I, I didn't want to be ashamed again. I didn't want to be embarrassed again, and so I kind of went, okay, hold on. <laughs> Maybe he's there, and I shouldn't say anything out loud, so people quit thinking that I'm foolish, but I also realized my son was gone. And so I went, all right, guys, has anybody seen Caden? And apparently, like a minute after that first time, he had gotten up, went with the rest of the kids, and they went into a camper, and they were hanging out elsewhere. And everybody else had seen it, and it was there. And if I had given into my shame that very first time, 
I would have been a worse dad. Because what would ended up happening, what shame does to us is it causes physiological and spiritual. Now, this one wasn't so much as spiritual, but real, real deep shame, when you really get caught doing something or are embarrassed about something that's going on, will totally destroy you and make you feel like God is completely distant. And the physiological response is like a flood of emotions, and you make bad decisions. Like, I don't know how I sounded that first time when I thought Caden wasn't there, but I probably sounded like an angry dad. Caden, where are you? And everybody just kind of looked at me. And if I would have given my shame on that second time, because this is what we do when we have shame. We either fight or flight. And sometimes it's a mixture of both of them. It's a really sick mixture of both of them. But I would have either like just been like, okay, I'm going to sit back and uh, run away and maybe go to Karina and be like, Karina, you should have been watching him or to the, everybody else, you guys should have been watching him. Or I could have uh, done the, the fight mode and like started attacking and been like, Caden, where were you? You should have told me you were going somewhere and gotten all over him and hovered and helicoptered over him and done all that stuff. But I paused. I thought about it. And everything ended up being okay. The reason why we're talking about shame this morning is because I firmly believe the biggest tool that Satan has always had over us. Make sure you hear that, because we live in a world today where we think all this stuff is new. It's not. Satan has always had over us is the act of accusing us and making us think that we're not enough, which is to make us feel ashamed. That's the biggest tool he's always had. You know how I know that? The Hebrew word for Satan, Hasatan, literally means the accuser what his name means. That's what he does to Job. And so he tries to create shame and guilt in our lives that make us feel like we're not good enough, that we're not the father's children, and he doesn't love us, that there's this distance. And we've got to be really careful about that, brothers and sisters, because the world is still trying to the same thing today. We use terms like cancel culture, shaming, that kind of stuff, where we back off we either fight or flight, and we are wrong both ways that we go and the mixture of all of them, where we don't end up living as children of God. And dads that are in this room, we need to be really careful because Satan does a really good job at messing with us as being good dads over our kids when we're reacting out of shame and being ashamed for a lot of things, either of our kids or of ourselves while we're doing um, life. So I really want to encourage you on that one. Shame has this ability to separate you from who you normally are. It has this ability of flooding your emotions, giving you the inability to be able to think about what you're saying and doing and being reactive. It has this amazing, amazing ability, and yes, I'm speaking for myself. I don't know if I'm speaking for you on this of amplifying my insecurities and making me feel like I'm not enough. And so I react by trying to overcome that, which just makes it look a whole much more like that. So I thought I was being a bad dad last night because I didn't know where my son was. I sounded like a worse father as I was trying to find where my son was. Like I announced to everybody that was there that I didn't know where Caden was and he was right there. And so shame has a way of doing that to us. We're in the midst of a series talking about how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're in a mini-series in the midst of the year right now in that of looking at how the early Christians were as they followed Jesus as the way. And if you remember, in Acts chapter 2, Peter speaks a sermon where he clearly says to these Jewish people that they crucified the Messiah they messed up. And their very first response should be one of shame, saying, we missed it. We didn't understand the scriptures. Wow, we messed up. God must hate us and be distanced from us right now. That's what the response sh should have been according to the world. But instead, the response was, oh, we messed up. We have shame. Brothers, what should we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Which is another way of saying of the removal of your shame, so you may not be ashamed. 
and this gift, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and this gift is for everyone, for all generations to come. You go on in the book of Acts, you get to chapter 9, and you find out about this young man who has been zealous for the Lord, who has been all about God's word, and he's been in it so hard, and he, he's actually become a teacher of the law, a rabbi, who's been in it so much, a Pharisee of Pharisees, he calls himself, that he loves it, that he's been going around and persecuting Christians because he thought that they were blaspheming. He thought that they were telling lies. He thought that they were bringing shame to the people of God and were going to cause things to fall apart as they have in the past from the history that he's read. If you don't know who that is, by the way, his name was Saul at that time, and he eventually becomes Paul. He tells his story three times in the book of Acts, which I don't know about you, but I would have found it kind of embarrassing, his story. Because he was, he was getting letters and breathing murderous threats, he says in the book of Galatians, towards the Christians, and he knows good and well what the Ten Commandments are. What's one of the Ten Commandments about murderous threats? Thou shalt not murder. He should have known how much he was messing up. He should have felt ashamed. He should have ran away or fought even harder. But he tells the story of how he ends up encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus and how him and Jesus have this conversation. And in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26, he gives us a little bit more each time he retells this story about the things that Jesus had talked about. If anybody should have shame, it should be Paul. He was a part of killing Stephen. He was there holding the cloaks of the men while they threw stones on him as he declared the truth about Abraham's message that Jesus lived out and became all a part of. But he doesn't live in the shame. He's not ashamed of what he's done in the past because of who Jesus is. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Timothy chapter 1 with me. Now, if you're ashamed of this, just hear me out of this whole sermon, and uh, um, you'll realize that grace and goodness and keeping our eyes focused on Jesus is everything. I, I challenged all of us last week to read through 2 Timothy chapters 1 through 4. I'm ashamed I said chapters 1 through 3, and then remember that there's four chapters at, at the end of that. But one of the things that I hope you noticed if you've done this, if you haven't done it, don't live in your shame. Just do it. Like, that's the whole thing about shame is it, it usually like buries us and keeps us from actually doing things that we should be doing and sometimes causes us to live into our insecurities in some weird, nasty cycle where we keep doing the things we don't like that what we're doing. Paul talks about that in, other, in Romans as well. But regardless, what you'll notice as Paul talks to Timothy, who was a young minister in Ephesus, the church in Ephesus at the time, what you'll notice is his perspective is it's always about Jesus. It is always about following the way, the truth, and the life. The decisions you make, regardless of the shame and the, the, the backwardness of things other people are doing that you should be ashamed of, will be washed away if you keep your eyes focused on this truth. Look what he says here. Actually, I'll start in verse number one because he says some really great things about Jesus there. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, Speaking of Father's Day, what does that mean? Paul, he's not, Timothy is not his son, his, like, biological son. What does that mean Paul thinks about Timothy? That's beautiful to think of. Grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers day and night. Okay, I just told Saul to Paul's story, right? I just told you how he had things that he should have been ashamed of because he missed God's plan. He missed what it was all about. But did you notice that as he's writing to Timothy? Here he goes, I thank God, who I once did really horrible things and should be ashamed for, because of Jesus. No, he says, I thank God with a clear conscience, as did my fathers and my grandparents. I hope you notice that Paul keeps a clear line of thought that his zealousness still remains. 
The only difference was he learned something new. He learned about Jesus, that Jesus was the fulfillment of all. And so he continues on with Timothy and says, I don't have any shame. I, I have a clear conscience. Verse 4, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. By the way, you get rid of all that bad worldly shame out of your life and you're going to have nothing but joy. It's a good life with, without having that in there. I am reminded of your sincere faith, the faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear. By the way, shame or fear is also often a part of shame. A spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And then he says this, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So what I understand so far here in reading this is that Paul has been walking with Jesus for a long time, and he's mentored young men like Timothy and Titus to go in to share the good news in the church in Ephesus and other places that, about the gospel, about the good news, that our shame's not the end of us, that there's forgiveness after repentance and turning towards him. And so he tells Timothy, who's struggling in ministry, did you catch that earlier on, that Timothy's in tears? He's stressed. By the way, what's well, one of the biggest factors of shame when you have shame in your life? Isn't it stress? Isn't it that weight? When, when, when people, uh, by the way, shame shows up really strongly in the world today in many different ways. There's all these different names Christians are given whenever, like on social media sites or in person, whenever stuff is going on. And we say, like Tom did this morning, he got up and said, we celebrate communion because God created everything. And the world's like, what do you mean God created everything? Were you there to be able to see that? We know science. Shame on you for talking about God because we're able to see that. And us Christians are like, okay, sorry. We kind of back down, right? By the way, did you catch what I said in that, what the world normally says? Were you there to see it? Why do we never respond, were you there to see it? With love? And say, isn't the definition of science is the obs observation of facts? Okay. You can't observe something if it was forever. You can give facts and kind of be like, huh, I wonder. But we have to recognize the truth that it takes faith both ways. And by the way, for those of you that think I just spoke badly against science, I firmly believe we should explore God's creation and be in awe, and we should learn from it and observe it and learn from it because we get to know about the character of God and know who he is and who we are by observing that stuff. But the world tries to shut us up by saying, wow, that was stupid. That was really dumb. Why did you speak that up? And they tried to shame us. And oftentimes in shame, we let that physiological response boil up to where we either respond with a whole bunch of anger and a whole lot of words as we fight, or we flight and back away. And Paul tells Timothy, all right, I see you're in the midst of a lot of struggles. I hear your tears as you write your letter to me about how hard it is to do ministry when you've got these false teachers coming in, these two guys that are distracting the church, and they're saying, Timothy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just a young man. And Paul says, hey, remember, don't be ashamed. I'm not ashamed. And also, don't even be ashamed of me, even though I'm in prison at the moment. Because it's about the good news. It is about the good news. It's about the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father, who is Jesus. Verse 9. Actually, I'm going to read 8 through, uh, I think, 11, because it's a long sentence that Paul goes on here. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering with the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed. Did you catch that? By the way, usually when people say stuff twice, you should pay attention to what that they said twice. Sometimes in the middle of it all, you'll be like, all right, where are you going with this? I'm kind of confused. And this book ends it, and this says, oh, they're talking about the fact that shame, Paul's saying, shame doesn't shape my life. But Jesus does, because all the middle stuff was about Jesus. For which I suffer as I do. He's talking about being in prison at the moment, have, going through physical stuff, even some spiritual stuff, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the way, I do have to say this. I'm not ashamed of what the church has done in the past. Those things that I do disagree with. When they've taken scriptures like the one that I just read and said, all right, our pattern's got to be completely right because when Noah built the ark, he made it out of gopher wood. And if we do anything else by anything that's said, we're going to be completely wrong or we're going to miss it. And when I was younger, I went, amen, we've got to get everything completely right to the T, otherwise God's not going to love us. Did you catch what Paul said there? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then he says, I want to make sure I say it word for word. I do not want to missay this right here. Follow the pattern of sound words or sound doctrine that you have heard from me. So, if you stop there, you go, all right, we've got to make sure that everything, all of our teachings are completely like in a row. So we make sure that we take communion just right, that our worship is just right. We go through all that, right? But look what he says, what the sound teaching and sound doctrine is about. By the way, he says the same thing in Ephesians 4 as well. That you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The sound doctrine and sound teaching is about the way, the truth, and the life. It's about Jesus. I'm not ashamed that we've been wrapped up in rules in the past like Pharisees have been during the time of Jesus. The reason why I'm not ashamed of that, and when I've done it myself, is because we do it because we love God, and we want to make sure that we're responding right to his stuff. But we need to be careful that we don't miss what it's really about. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation for all. That we don't miss it's about Jesus and that God loves us as a father and that he's watching over us. So Paul says, and I love this, I am suffering, yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day, which is his life. Brothers and sisters, the world tries to use shame, either purposefully or accidentally, but it happens to keep us from trusting in Jesus and following him as the way. Instead, the world tries to say, well, the famous three-word three statement that's been used so much, so often lately, don't judge me, as a response of us saying, well, as I follow Jesus, I learn that this is better for my life. And the world will respond by saying, don't judge me. Our response should be, okay, I'll follow Jesus. I'll keep focusing on him. Instead, in letting the shame of what the world's trying to do is make us feel like we're incredibly judgmental, unloving people, misdirect us from who we are really being, which is, all right, I'm going to trust in Jesus, so I'm going to keep following him and trust in him. Because when Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, and when the early Christians decided to follow Jesus, those early Jews on the day of Pentecost decided to follow Jesus when they should have been broken by their shame, decided to follow him, they couldn't help but talk about Jesus with everybody that was around them. Because they weren't ashamed. They had no shame. So Paul speaks to the church in Rome. This is to the church in Ephesus through Timothy. This is 2 Timothy. And if you haven't read it this past week, try reading it again. It's four chapters. It'll take you about 10 minutes maybe to read it. Um, it's really powerful how he keeps looking at Jesus over and over again, that Jesus is the way that Timothy needs to remember as he's ministering there at the church. 
But you get into the book of Romans, and Romans is one of the most loved books of the New Testament uh, that Paul writes. Um, You either love Romans or you hate Romans. (laughs) And Romans is a beautiful book. It's a beautiful story to the church in Rome from Paul saying, all right. And he doesn't use exactly these words, but he does start it out this way. And he says, all right, the world's trying to bring shame down on you and make you feel like you, you're never going to be good enough and that you, got, you have to live by a law and that's going to make you good enough or misdirect you from who you are going to be as followers of Jesus. And he reminds them in Romans 1:16. This, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then the Gentile. And he says, no matter who you are, the gospel removes shame. And he's not being ashamed, he's going to talk about Jesus and share the good news. He then goes on to talk about a situation of sin that most Christians will look at and they'll say, wow, this world is a shameful place and I'm ashamed of some people in my life because they have practiced this. And if you don't believe me, you need to read chapter 2, verse 1. Because he then goes through a list of sins at the end of chapter 1, after that one sin he talks about, and lists sins. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, we've all have a reason for shame because we've all practiced in some of these sins. I mean, you go to chapter 3, verse 23, and it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Father. But praise be to God, who saved us through Jesus Christ. The world tries to bring us down and cause us to live into our sins and make us feel like we're not good enough, that we'll, we'll never be good enough for the Father by bringing shame into our lives. And essentially, all the world's trying to do is have power over us and, and keep us from speaking what is true, what is holy, and what is good, and really, to keep us from thinking those things. And Paul reveals in a world that was going through the same struggle during that time, during a time that the, that the government was saying, Caesar is Lord, he will be your God and take care of you. Paul says... No, God's son came and gave his life that we may have life. And he rose again on that third day, letting us know that death has been conquered once and for all and no longer has any power over us. So dads that are in this room, don't let the world shame you into thinking that you shouldn't be a father. The world's trying to do that right now. Moms that are in this room, don't let the world shame you into thinking that you should be a mother. The world's trying to do that right now. By the way, it's not new. The world's been trying to do that. And when I say the world, I mean like the, the ways of Hasatan, the accuser. Sin, brokenness that's in this world, not the world that God has created, the heavens and the earth where his will is done. I'm talking about worldliness. The world's trying to separate us out and keep us from thinking that we are good enough. It's trying to bring shame into our lives. And we've held back from, honestly, our insecurity has made us even more mean as dads sometimes. And we've held back from living as good parents, as good children of God because of shame. Let's not let shame have any control over us anymore. Because as Paul says, I am not ashamed multiple times throughout his writings, we're able to live that truth and say, we are not ashamed because of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And we can re- kind of shape the words today because we don't really care so much about Jews and Gentiles anymore. It's for everyone. The good news of Jesus Christ is that God the Father loves us. We know that he loves us because he sent his one and only son That whomsoever may believe in him will not perish and have eternal life. And let's not forget John 3, 17. He did not send his son to condemn the world, which is to bring shame to the world, but to save the world through him. If you need to follow Jesus and you're not a follower of of his, follow him in truth and faith. Follow him in baptism. Follow him trusting that he came to give you life and not to live a life of shame. And that, you know, there's a reason why shame is in this world. Because we need to be reminded of when we do silly things and broken things. But shame should never 
begin and end with us being in outright uncontrol and being in fight or flight. It should always bring us closer to the Father and say, all right, Father, teach me. Well, we can even say, discipline me, that I may truly be your child. By the way, if you don't like that term, discipline, I challenge you to read Hebrews chapter 12 because there's really good stuff in what God is doing as he loves us as a father. If you want to follow Jesus, follow him in faith and baptism. And if you need prayer for anything, I ask you to come forward when we stand and sing in just a moment. Dads, I pray that God continues to bless you, not just on Father's Day only, but all throughout your life as you mentor and share the good news of Jesus Christ in the lives of, the, of your children that are around you. And I want to remind you that your children aren't only your biological children, that your children are those who trust you, who look up to you as a spiritual leader, role model, mentor, however you want to use it. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, you're doing the same thing. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. There are people that are looking up to you, gentlemen, you may not even know it sometimes, as spiritual fathers. Be a blessing for them. Don't let shame wear you down and make you feel like you're disconnected and flood you where you have really bad responses. Trust in the Lord. Seek out his direction and his will. Moms that are in here, as we talked about on Mother's Day, trust in the Lord. The same thing, gentlemen. Trust in the Lord. Keep your eyes focused on him because there are little ones that are looking up to you. Some of those little ones are older little ones, but they're, they're looking up to you. They're looking to you and following your example. Don't let shame cause you to have a bad example because God loves you. Even in the midst of your guilt and sins that you've done, he sent his son that you may repent and you may be his child. I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And I pray the Lord turn his face to you and give you his peace. If